Hello there, Perpetual Chess viewers. I just wanted to go over a couple things before we get you to a fantastic interview with Dr. Kenneth Regan, international master and one of the world's foremost authorities on engine cheat detection. Uh, number one, we're trying out video format over these next few weeks. Um, so be sure that you are subscribed to Perpetual Chess on YouTube, as well as on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, where we will continue to be serving up uh, audio only podcasts. Uh, number two, I wanted to thank our sponsors. First and foremost, our presenting chess education sponsor, Chessable.com. Of course, Chessable has its proprietary space repetition move trainer technology that allows you to remember opening lines and tactical sequences. For myself, I'm tired of getting bad positions against the Catalan, so I put uh, I am Christoph Zalecki's Keep It Simple with Black. The Catalan stuff is my only priority right now. I will not rest until I stop with the bad position. So if you play the Catalan, I'm going to be ready finally. Uh, number two, I want to thank aimchess.com. Of course, aimchess has an algorithm which gathers your games from the major sites, from chess.com and from Lee Chess, and gives you actionable patterns of ways you can work on your game, tactics that you missed, uh, openings that you struggle in or thrive in, so on and so forth. And then last but not least, least i wanted to give a shout out to the blue wire podcast network if you're interested in sports uh lifestyle comedy whatever it may be be sure to check out what blue wire has to offer in the podcast space so uh remember to subscribe everyone and thanks for watching let's get you to the interview hello everyone and welcome back to perpetual chess we are joined this week by a much requested guest a return guest he has a degree in mathematics from princeton and oxford he's a professor in computational complexity theory at the university of buffalo of course, if you're listening to this, you probably know him better as one of the world's leading experts on chess engine cheat detection. He is also quite a strong chess player himself and quite an accomplished one. Uh, he was the 1977 U.S. Junior Co-Champion and once held the record of the youngest USCF master since Bobby Fischer. Uh, he was on the podcast in July of 2019, and I also recommend listeners, if you haven't already listened to his conversation from about a month ago, uh, with James Altucher discussing the Hans Niemann, uh, Magnus Carlsen controversy, which we will get an update on along with everything else he has been up to. So let's welcome Dr. Kenneth Regan back to the show. Welcome, Dr. Regan. Thank you very much for having me on again. Yeah, I'm so happy for you to take the time. You must be quite busy um, with all yes, this. So uh, well, at least at least I caught up with grading my course and uh, giving an exam yesterday. So uh yeah but the, that that yes things have kept me very busy yeah and how does that work like that's your main job um and i know you're doing a lot of work behind the scenes on top level tournaments that are going on uh just to um check for potential cheating is that is that still done on a volunteer basis dr regan or are you compensated for your time well uh, yeah so i now have an intellectual property contract with fide that was uh, signed uh, early last March. Uh, it's it's uh, for both my screen software and for the use of my full test. And I now have two other helpers who are empowered to run my C++ code. I did have to spend some late nights in July porting it from Linux Unix to Windows because they, they were not able to access uh, Unix Linux like um, you know, most universities can. Uh, so, uh, so that kept me busy. So things are looking up on uh, on that sphere, but still most of the manual, the server for my screening test is still a long way from being implemented. So I do that work manually to move data from one place to the other, but the bulk of the work is automated. Okay, well, that's that's good to hear. Uh, and we should mention for listeners, we are recording this on uh, Thursday, October 13th, uh, hoping to get this out the following Tuesday, and that we're offering this on the YouTube channel as well. For anyone not already watching on YouTube, uh, Dr. Regan, when he did his interview with James Altucher, shared his screen a few times, so we wanted to have that option. So um, I don't think it'll be the majority of the conversation, but for anyone listening who wants to switch over to YouTube, uh, assuming no technical issues are subsequent, uh, you'll be able to do so. So, Dr. Regan, where I'd like to begin with all of the chess news is with the most recent development. Um, as we again, as we record this, the chess.com report about Hans Niemann 
came out uh, slightly more than a week ago. Uh, so I'm curious, A, if you read that, and B, if anything within that report uh, surprised you. Of course, your own name was in it, uh, somewhat unsurprisingly. Well, I have not poured over every word. And in fact, I just noticed something at the bottom of page 57 that I'd missed because my eyes had been drawn to the top of page 58. Uh, <laughs> and I must say that, you know, I, I the, the report confirms a few things. So yes, I am mentioned. And yes, I agree with the findings that the report quotes me as uh, agreeing with. Whether I would agree with the Rort's other claims, I cannot reproduce it in my limited setting. So I must first remind for the reader that I deal only with the moves in the game. I do not involve myself with information that may, may be gathered through the interface. And the report in Appendix B, where it quotes its own uh, chess.com letter to Hans Niemann in September, does mention uh, the kind of interface and something they call toggling uh, interface evidence. And I have not had access to that, but it is quite possible that knowledge of particular moves uh, when this toggling happens would change some of my results that I currently show as inconclusive. Yeah, that that makes sense. And you've mentioned also in, in your own work, I guess for online, you would have access to time, uh, how much time is spent per move, but when you do OTB, time is not an input. Is that correct? Gen generally not. I mean, neither chess space nor the weekend chess preserves time information, even when it's available, most notably in game files downloaded from Chess 24. Okay. Uh, but I do not have a large enough corpus of training data in order to use that information. Uh, there is a, a way I may be able to use that information um, by extending a relationship between time and rated skill quality that has been supported better by investigations this year, including Ali Reza Farooz's famous all-night bullet marathon. <laughs> okay. so, so I'll show that on my screen uh, at, at some point. Great. Great. Um, um, so with would so you're saying that the code is basically the framework is there for you to incorporate time with OTB chess. It's just that that you haven't gotten uh, you have as you say you haven't been able to get the information for the most part. Uh, right. So I can't. I have. I do not have enough training data in order to incorporate it as an explicit parameter in my model. Okay. What I do is I use my calibrations from standard rating. But for rapid and blitz, I employ a curve that tells me how much the faster time control degrades the rating-based quality. It's a rough uh, measure because obviously chess skill degrades in different ways when you play faster time pressure. You can't say that the impact on tactics is the same as the impact on strategy. Uh, probably it increases your likelihood of blundering more than simply decreasing your rating 500 points would do. Nevertheless, it, it gets results that are fairly close and which I am also able to cross-validate in various ways. So I find it reasonable, I find it reasonably uh, able to employ it. So then if someone's in time pressure, like has only three minutes left at move 25 of a game, then I can estimate the resulting degradation in the player's rating uh, from that. And, and, uh, and what would be your basic estimate if a 2,800 player has three minutes in a game? What, how many points would you subtract from their level? Yeah, so, so if you have three minutes for the whole game, if you're playing 180 plus zero, then the rating adjustment is 715 points lower. Now, if you just have three minutes for turn 25 for 15 moves, I probably prorate that and make that like you have 12 minutes for the whole game, although it's the critical part of the game. Uh, so, I, so I have to say there, there is some manual thought uh, involved. If I prorated it completely 
and did it for 12 minutes of the game, then, well, time to share my screen and show the curve that I'm talking about. Okay. I'll share, try sharing, um, I'll share just the uh, Chrome application and I hope that that works well enough. So let me explain what this is. Um, this is a curve of the estimate of um, rating drop-off now uh, based on a standard time control. Now, uh, the, you'll notice that there are several lines that are, es that are different estimates, and I'll explain what those different estimates are. There are two places where those lines come together, and the, the x-axis is the, is the time control. And it's the time to 60 moves, which is the same standard used by the universal chess rating system of Mark Wickman and Jeff Sonas, where they're trying to make a common footing for rapid blitz and standard ratings. So game three plus two is the time control used at the world blitz. So that should be over here on the five minute line. And game 10, uh, 15 plus 10 is the standard for world rapid. So the 10 second increment over 60 moves gives you 10 more minutes. So I equate that to game 25. And the, the two second, game three plus two, gives you um, uh, two more minutes. So I equate game three plus two to game five, the standard five minute blitz chess that we all know and love. Uh, so I have reliable data from that, from my estimations of the intrinsic ratings of the in-person world blitz and world rapid. I have another data point, the zero point here, and this is for game 165. The FIDE time control is game 150, and according to this curve, it makes about a 10 ELO difference. The reason I use game 165 is that that's the best approximation to the Bundesliga time control, which has a 15 minute increment to turn 60 that I count. Um, and the um, uh, for NCL, and it's midway, the elite Vikonse and other elite tournaments have had time controls that are game 1D 95 to game 210 on this system. So I originally thought this was a midway point. If I redo this curve, I will use the standard FIDE time control. It's not going to make a whole lot of difference. And then I need a fourth point in order to do my estimation. And I get the fourth point from a really funny source. By estimating the rating of suicide chess or completely random chess. Hmm. And this is this is where I use the chess.com cap system, which is on what's supposed to be a zero to 100 scale, trying to imitate a grade point average from the look of it. So, you know, 94 is an A, um, you know, 77 is a C. Um, but uh, their zero point of their scale is down around ELO minus 3,000. Hmm. And uh, so that's what I've put here in these curves. And so that gives me four points, uh, four equations, and four unknowns. And I can solve them in different ways. Now, I'll be wonky for 30 seconds. Okay, so what's going on here is... The orange line is something called um, uh, Ackerman, Aiken, Aiken, now I'm blanking on the name, extrapolation, which is the most likely way to fill in when you're missing a variable. Okay, it's a different looking equation from the others. These other equations are um, logistic curves in the logarithm of the time, which turn out to be just inverse polynomial curves, using lower and lower ratings for estimates for the ratings of suicide chess. And this is the one that's closest to, to chess.com to the estimate from CAPS. So what you see in my picture is that the logistic methods, purple, green, blue, and red, are converging, verging to the Aitken extrapolation. So that to me is internal evidence that I'm on the right track. And so I use the orange curve uh, for 
setting the time control for blitz and rapid times in between. Okay, so for instance, if I'm doing a tournament that's game 17, then I'm going to find game 17 is over here. And instead of subtracting 240, I'm going to subtract 305 from the rating and estimate that that's the baseline quality. Now, I had one really important, I do this also in my screening formula, and I've had several interesting vindications of this policy. So the Coinbase rapid tournaments were about the fastest thing you could call rapid. This is the chess.com rapid championship this year. Uh, they had the Swiss at game 10 and the uh, finals at game 10 plus two second increment. So game 12 in my system. And so I applied my dedicated systems to that and I got an average score of 50.03 using my adjustments with my generic rapid settings based on gain 25 was much lower, but I got very close to bullseye using this curve. So that to me is internal evidence that this curve is very close to the truth over a huge mass of players. The other evidence, the other question I've had is I can, is if I apply things for settings between 25 and five minute blitz. Then I am interpolating. And interpolation is, you know, statistically okay. But if I go to four minute blitz for Title Tuesday or three minute blitz for Neiman and the report and further, then I'm extrapolating. And extrapolating is a lot dodgier. By the way, the black line is if you don't take the logarithm of the time and it's very clearly wrong. So just ignore that. Um, so this is extrapolation, but I got an amazing assist from Ali Riza Ferozja when he had his all night um, <laughs> bullet marathon because that enabled me to pin down game in 30 seconds, 0 0.5 on this scale. So if I take my curve estimate for it, um, we could go way, way down and take a look at the ELO quality of that. Well, this is the curves, by the way, themselves are apart. Uh, so the orange curve intersects it uh, a fair bit down. In fact, I've even lost track of where it is. So here it is. So the orange curve is about minus 1,400 uh, ELO, 1,415, minus 1,415 ELO. Uh, then I measured that using my full model with the intrinsic rating, and I got measurements of 1,600 below as ELO. And with my screening formula, you would get estimates closer to 1,250 below as ELO. So this curve is right between the two. Obviously, there's greater variation with greater noise. You're playing 60 moves in, in, uh, in 30 seconds. <laughs> right. But... Um, Nevertheless, the remark, the 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 uh, results were quite close enough, and you know I can fudge other things. Uh, interestingly enough, there did not seem to be much of a quality drop off toward the seventh and eighth hours of that marathon. Wow, that's fascinating. But, you know, I could maybe say, well, if I got a hundred bullet games played midday instead of in the middle of the night maybe that would cover the 200 points difference. Uh, you know, in his quality, I'd be even closer. At any rate, that enables me now to, to apply settings for time controls, you know, even two, you know, two minute bullet. So that's now including the stage of the women's speed championship that was game one plus one, which equates to game two. And which according to this orange curve, as a subtraction of 845 year left. Okay. okay, so so to put uh, a, what you just said in layman's terms, the, the famous Neroditsky and uh, Ali Reza Faruja match, which Faruja played in the middle of the candidates, uh, came into some criticism for staying up late. Um, obviously, right. these guys are absolutely uh, mind boggling at fast chess, bullet chess in particular. But if that were played at a classical time control, um, their their elos would be about sixteen hundred. Is that did I interpret that correctly? In other words, 
it, in other words, I got results, you know, 1600 below their standard helos, consistent, roughly consistent with what my curve would project. So actually, if it's minus 1600, it would be 2800 ish minus 1600. So 1200 yes. strength, if it I were classical? Near 1200, exactly. Wow. And Naraditsky also, very similar to his rating, actually a, a, a little bit more of a drop off. And I also identified the other player in Turkey, and uh, that was um, a reason. That was also reasonably consistent with the player's rating. Okay. Uh, so, so that now enables me to interpolate at these lower time controls with uh, reasonable confidence. Okay. Well, it's fascinating stuff, uh, Dr. Regan. But let's let's zoom out a little bit and get back to, for at least for now, the. Neiman case. Um, right. So there's been obviously a lot of public discussion about this um, over the past month, uh, some discussion of, of your model in particular and others just more generally, um, people showing different levels of numeracy and innumeracy in their discussions. Has there been right. any sort of common discourse that has particularly frustrated you? Well, I, I, I mean, yeah, I, it's a question of where to begin. <laughs> so first of all, there have been a lot of people, including Yosha Iglesias, testing things with let's check. And mm -hmm. let's check has its own disclaimer. It says this is not to be used for cheating detection. Now, let's check in its current form polls the chess-based cloud where you have any number of engines. Okay. And it seems to be that, that if any of those engines likes a move, then it was counted as a match. So this is absolutely not a regular procedure. It's going to get an artificially high concordance rate. Uh, second is there was also apparently a feedback loop because Neiman's games attracted interest. More people tested and tried a lot of different engines on them, which gave more opportunity to for one of the engines to match the move. And uh, so uh, skewing the results even more. Um, so, as I say, it's important to have a, a regular scientific uh, procedure for things. Um, then I did not get time overnight to look more closely at the claim by the person in Brazil that Neiman's uh, average cent upon loss is very flat, but I did have some friends look at it and, and just see if they could roger my observation. The person shows a blue line, that's the signal, the average cent upon loss, and a red line representing the standard deviation. And the person's red line is considerably above the blue line on the same scale, or at least that's how it appears. So that's simply admitting that the noise is dwarfing your signal. And um, so uh, that is uh, also not... Um, uh, so I, as I haven't looked into it uh, myself, so maybe I'm shortchanging it, but that was the one thing that I, that I showed from my uh, simple viewing of the uh, of the uh, uh, claim. And then there's CAPS score itself. Now CAPS is not the chess.com cheating detection, okay? And in fact, I can show you, if you just simply go to the chess.com article uh, on CAPS and look at their chart of CAP scores for players by ELO rating, and then simply plot it, you get a very good linear fit. So you don't get any sign of rounding over, but your regression line crosses the 100% mark at ELO rating 20, near 2650. So uh, that's maybe why they don't show their chart. So, so that you know, they tell me it's supposed to round over, but uh, you know, they did announce caps two, and in August of 2020, and then I think the Queen's Gambit effect, the mushrooming of their base, just prevented the uh, the um, them from uh, following through on that. But in any event, using cap scores to estimate. Um, uh, for gene detection is just not scientific at either. What a, so, same for Lee Chess Senapons, I would assume, or 
Yo, let's see, I would send Juan Law. So there's actually, so let me show. So so you had Nate Solon on, mm -hmm. and I must apologize. I did intend to listen to rather than skim that that entire podcast. I know but you're a busy did, guy. Did, you're forgiven. <laughs> yes. Did Nate uh, reference, though, my comments about uh, normalizing average center point loss? I don't um, believe he did, no. Okay. So let me share that. So I'll go into sharing my screen again. Okay. So, so this is important, and it's also part of my general outlook on data science. So now I should mention also that I co-write a major blog in computing, Girdle's Law Center and P equals NP with the uh, distinguished computer science Richard Lipton, with whom we've co-authored a textbook for MIT Press on quantum computing that's been successful enough to go to a second edition. I was, I forgot I'm sharing my screen, so I won't hold, uh, hold on to that. Um, so anyway, so this is the blog, and I've put, there are numerous chess articles on this blog. It's basically functioning as a pre-publication venue for my ideas, uh, the pandemic kept me so busy, I haven't been able to start writing those papers. But so here's, however, a post on the blog called When Data Serves Turkey. And this is what happens if you use the raw average set upon loss figure without scaling. So this is plotting, these charts are with, with Stockfish 7 and Komodo 10, which were current at the time. Um, plotting the relationship of average cent upon loss to ELO rate. And this looks like a gorgeous linear fit going to 2,800, okay? I mean, in social sciences, you'd kill to have R squared 0 0.995. You know, this looks like the gold standard. But notice one implication. This gold standard is saying that zero error, which you would equate to perfect chess play has an ELO rating under 3,200. And we know that's wrong from the sensible rating, not only of chess engines, but also of the human computer teams that took part in a, a freestyle tournaments. Okay. So this is an internally beautifully consistent metric that is giving a palpable wrong answer. And, and that's you know the first caveat of my post. So what could be wrong? is that the average set upon loss depends upon the overall position value. And what these graphs show is it's not just a case of, oh, if a player is four or five pawns ahead, then you won't care about being super accurate. You know, a move that gives away a pawn value doesn't make much a difference. You're still crushing. Actually, what these graphs show is that the phenomenon of proportionality goes clear down to zero. Basically, we estimate differences in moves in proportion to the value of the position. And I think it's really the same psychology that the Nobel laureate Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky did in studies showing that we humans will drive across town to save $5 on a $20 appliance. But we won't care about $5 so much if we're treating at dinner for 200 and uh, $5 on a $2,000 di new dishwashing machine is considered absolutely nothing. So our perception of money is in proportion to the total. Well, we play chess the same way according to this. So I correct for it. My correction's not perfect and it can't be perfect for uh, an even wonkier reason I can go into, but it's pretty good. And when I correct for it, I get a similar relation. So this is what I call my ASD. But at least now I've got my zero point at 3,400 instead of 3,200. And the difference is absolutely significant because the error bars on this regression are plus or minus 28, 29 ELO. Okay, so I've gotten a significantly better answer. I don't think this answer is correct either because zero average cent upon loss is not the be all and end all of perfect play. But at least this line is, is, is giving a, a better answer. And the real point is um, what my scaling does, especially scaling down in positions where one side is way ahead. A, a friend of mine, a data scientist in Chicago, 
uh, wrote something that probably should become a paper, proving that this has very much the same effect. My scaling is very much the same effect as running the data through a standard noise reduction filter. So the noise reduction filter will auto detect the noise and you can see from the blotchier dots and adjust itself accordingly. And the adjustment it's doing is similar to what I'm doing with my logarithmic scaling. Okay, so this by the way is the first element in my work that really distinguishes from, from Guide and Bratko and other people. And it, it's very important for precision. What Guide and Bratko did is they cut off at a two center point plus or minus position balance eval. And that helps a lot. But since the effect goes clear down to zero, it doesn't fully compensate for it. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, and then the... Um, so so that so I so I haven't I must say I haven't gotten to the bottom of what happens with the average center point loss study um, if I were to substitute my uh, you know noise reduced version okay but um, nevertheless I have my own data which is which is done on using a second principle and that is looking at variations that have been normalized over the whole set of players of Neiman's rating. Okay, so not just looking at Neiman's data, but training with respect to a much more reliable corpus. This is so my website. Now, I've not yet had time to write an article on the Girdle's Lost Letter blog explaining this more, but, you know, I can say it speaks for itself. So right. here's, here's anyway the point. So this is using my ROI measure, which incorporates the T1 match and the average center pawn loss into a zero, a common zero to 100 scale with 50, the expectation based on one's rating. Okay, this is what my screening reports for the World Junior uh, US Championship and the Singfield Cup were doing all along. So what I've done is I've sorted a bunch of, uh, of performances. So I regularly screen tournaments out of the week in chess and chess base updates every week. So long before I cared particularly about Hans Moke Neiman, um, I had all this data to hand. So I just grabbed it and sorted it by my raw outlier index measure, which as I said, is composed of these two things. And uh, then, uh, formed into a common index. And what this shows is a distribution that's fairly well centered on, uh, on 50. It's not exactly on 50. This is the median of the, uh, I think, 97 data points that I have. Um, but this is also using Neiman's rating. And I'll come to this point too. His 2465 rating was frozen for much of 2020 and is probably a low estimate. So just that little change of, of using an updated rating for him probably covers, easily covers the distance between that and 50. But anyway, this is this is good enough as well. And so this is is it's it's uh within 50, it's 97 data points. So the scale here has a standard deviation of five. So according to the bell curve, 68% of the data points should be within five of the mean or median. The mean is very close to this median. So that's 45.6 to 50.6, and that's about two thirds of the data. Um, two standard deviations is 10, and there's, that's a one in 44 natural frequency for two sigma above. So from 97 data points, you should have two or three. Oh, there we are. There's three. Actually, if you use 60.6 strictly, it's only one. Anyway, completely normal. Uh, the distribution is a little lumpier than the bell curve, um, but it has the same vital statistics. Okay. So this, to me, is completely normal. No. Now, this includes Neiman's online chess since August 2020. Uh, so actually, not including the uh, tournaments accused by chess.com. 
Okay, now let me ask you, Dr. Regan, you mentioned uh, Yosha Iglesias' video um, and, um, you know, in the chess.com report, they also say they don't have evidence of Hans Niemann cheating over the board, while they do have right. evidence of him cheating uh, significantly online. But they do name a few tournaments that they consider to be slight outliers, such as the Capablanca Memorial and the World Open from 2021 and the Philadelphia Open from 2021. Yeah, uh, does your okay. data also flag those? I've got it right here. Okay. So, so no, it does not. It emphatically does not flag them. Interesting. Okay. So this is this is the other end that uh, that I've been dealing with, and I and uh, you know, I don't I I have to warn me about time limits, but I will get to uh, to the uh, scientific aspect of this. So this is Neiman's over the board chess, and it's you know the joint median is here. A very similar picture, fewer data points. And the thing to contrast it with is uh, Rouses, Igor's Rouses. The 23 events that were in chess space, um, so it's a reasonable sub, uh, sub selection of all the tournaments he played. And every single one of these data points is above average. So it's the Lake Wobegon effect. So the point huh. I'm making is that if Neiman were cheating in small increments like Rouses, or maybe alternately cheating and tanking, then I should see something in between complete normality and Rouses. But what I actually see is essentially complete normality. Okay. Now, and, and so if take... so if he were checking, yeah. say checking his phone, although in reality it might be getting a signal. But if he were only being helped in key moments, would your model pick up on on this? Well, whatever Rouses did, and Rouses, by the way, confessed to cheating with the old program High Arcs 4. So whatever Rouses was doing, I get an absolutely crystal clear signal out of this. Mm -hmm. So I mean, so we so Demon would have been had to, had to have been significantly smarter or less frequent or something like that than Rouses in order to, but as said. Then I would expect to see something in between, and I don't. Okay. Um, so why do you think that Chess.com's report mentioned those tournaments? A lot of people have mentioned those tournaments. I, I didn't hear about it from Chess.com first. It's well, so Neiman won the Havana Capablanca Memorial with seven and a half out of nine. That's a smashing score against players. Um, I'll say, well, let's use Stockfish fifteen. Okay. So, you know, so the, the field's rated 25.90 on average, Neiman's 26.38, so they're within 50 ELO of him. So to score seven and a half out of nine, that's, you know, two points above the field in a short tournament. That's going to attract a lot of attention. Okay. Uh, but my screening score for Neiman here is right on the 50 bullseye line. And if you look at this data for an explanation of why Neiman scored so many points, look in the average scale difference column of his opponents. His opponents had a 0.15 in my heavily scaled average center point loss. Okay. Significantly higher than most of the opponents of the other players, except for Luis Ernesto Quesada Perez, was also the benefit of a better. Uh, of a fair amount of, uh, of liberal play by the opponents. So they had okay. bad days against him, basically. Right. Okay. So I mean, maybe there's something about Neiman that induces bad play, uh, which um, you know can be a factor, especially in blitz tournaments. If you play a really challenging gambling style that often works in blitz. Uh, and the rating system should account for that. But in any event, um, that to me, is the uh, objective data-driven explanation for why Neiman did so well. Uh, the Sigmund tournament was mentioned to me in the same breath. Let's look at that with Stockshift 15. Now here Neiman plays well, and he's actually not the best in the field. Dils Grandilius was a little higher on the had, accuracy. Had a worse field. overall score, but, but according to the uh, engine metrics, played better. Yeah. Okay. That's right. A little bit, not significantly. It's only six games. But anyway, this is, you know, solidly in my normal range, 40 to 60 
within two, two sigma, the, the usual margin of error, normal range. So by the way, Neiman's opponents had by far the highest T1 match. Okay, so, uh, so you know, there are, with small data, you can get lots of conclusions. So that list I showed before uh, from Neiman's over the board ROI now, he does top this top thing is this GM norm tournament, which a lot of people have talked about in Charlotte. And yeah, he did clearly play well in that tournament, but I do not get a, uh, a uh, but the Z-score I get for that tournament is within the normal range. Yeah, and as I've mentioned, uh, Peter Giannato's proprietor of the uh, Charlotte Chess Center, he was sending you those games from everyone, not just from Neiman, but uh, he was having you check that as the tournament was going on. Do you, do you, right. okay. Yeah, and, and, and you know, there was, there was never any alarm from that, so. Um, Interesting also, stuff. Also, by the way, is in October, my pandemic lag adjustment for Neiman is probably close to the 2,500 at that point. So, so, so we can get to the, the rating rise uh, issue um, as well. So I think we'll go a uh, rating rise issue and then we'll go um, to, um, uh, to the dates in the report. And, and Carlson's assertion that Neiman cheated more recently. Uh, okay. Than... And I've got some listener questions for you eventually too, hopefully. So hopefully okay. you've got a bit of time. Right. So this again is the blog and the most scientifically important article about my chess work that I've written re recently is this pandemic lag article. And okay. so the reality is that with the lack of in-person chess in the pandemic, a lot of top of young players ratings were frozen, even while they were undoubtedly continuing their improvement curve. This is Annie Wang, the uh, U.S. junior women winner last time. And uh, so I estimated her uh, in the, uh, closer to 2,500 than her frozen rating when I was doing the screening for this. And on the whole, these rating estimates have been much more accurate than not doing that. The real challenge for me has been to estimate players at the time of their explosive growth as a youth. So that's Annie Wang when she was, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11. Okay. okay and I myself, yeah, that's when, zero to 1700 very quickly. Sorry, go on. Yeah. So when I started playing tournaments at age 11, I was rated, got a 1400 rating pretty quickly. Two years later, I was over 2,100, and then a few months later, I was a master. Um, so I gained 700 points in two years. So estimating this is the real challenge. Uh, and I've had numerous inquiries, including two last month, where it was a young player with the official rating beating players 500 points higher, and that seemed suspicious. And uh, But I said, look, that's that official rating is is a couple of years out of date. <laughs> uh, so you know this is what the player most likely is according to the the historic growth curves of young players, and uh, you know that dispelled both of those things. And to some extent, this is also uh, operating with Hans Neiman himself. So here is his uh, curve. And just in 2020, there's this flatness. He's 2465, and then he gets a couple of in-person. It goes to 2478 uh, between De in the December rating list. So people are dating his rise to the July rating list as one and a half years, but that's patently wrong. Uh, you should date it from the beginning of the pandemic, and then it would be two and a quarter years. And if so, so in other words, what I'm saying is that is true chess strength, especially since online chess has shown itself to be just as good for improving one's chess as in person, is going to be more along this kind of curve. Placing him yay higher, like I said, in, in, in at the time of the uh, October Charlotte tournament, he's probably right at just to write about 2,500. And that would lower his screening score a little more. 
here by this point, I would say is probably caught up. But that's because Neiman went barnstorming in Europe and played a lot of chess events. In fact, a lot more in-person chess than most young players have. And that also, I think, has, has, has expanded his time frame for improving. Right. Um, if you measured over games played instead of linear time, it would look different. Right. So this now takes me, so I better, I, I shouldn't be sharing my screen so much. I should come back and I'll come back to the listener questions. But I do want to shout out an article on chessbase.com. Yeah, Morning Constantine Land. I should read that article. Yeah, rest in peace. He was FIDE's best uh, expert on the physical ways of cheating and, and of machines to uh, monitor that. But if I go to September 30, a very helpful, just right. posting data. This is what scientists do. Frederick Friedel is a scientist, Oxford doctorate. Uh, okay. And so he just says, you know, here's the graph for Neiman. And here's the graph for a lot of other young players. The chess.com report, in fact, puts Pragananda above Neiman in some measurements. So nobody accuses him of cheating. Um, but even more than that, uh, when I appeared on Sasha Starr's chess show with Mikhail Marin, Marin drew attention to Levon Aronian. So now if you do Aronian chart at FIDE, um, then, and look at his rating progress chart. Look at the steep growth. And if the chart actually cuts off at 2003, if you want to get the same rating range at Neiman, you have to go back a bit. So go to his individual calculations. Those go back to July 2001 when he is 2532. So in a similar two and a quarter year time span, he ascended through essentially the same ranks of rating as Neiman and at a later age, born in 1982. So that's starting at age 19 to age 21. And, and Mikhail Marin said, yeah, um, you know, people thought that Aronian was stuck and he was, oh, here's a plateau that if I were to exchange this back. So the other thing about the chess.com report dwells on plateaus as being original, as being unusual. And yeah, I'll just say, give me a break to that. I myself, I, I got to 2230 in, uh, in 1973. At the time of the Atlantic Open, November 1975, I was still near 2230. I had a two and a half year plateau. I mean, I was doing other things, but I was playing in a lot of tournaments. And then suddenly in that November tournament, uh, I beat Walter Brown in round two. I beat Mark Deason in round three. I drew Pal Banco in round four. I drew Sal Matera in round five. And I lost in 112 moves to Arthur Bisquire in the last round, his two bishops against my bishop and knight. I gained 160 rating points to, to reach the 2370s something. That qualified me for the student team. Most notably, I kept that rating. And were you using so, engine assistance? In 1975? <laughs> right. <yeah. laughs> right. So, so that's the point. I mean, plateaus happen. It's one of these things where data does go in fits and starts, even when you're flipping a random coin and people are just not attuned to the uh, bumpiness of, of real data. So so I, so I, I mean, I put that put that to rest, and I wish the report. Uh, it sounds seems to me to be a self contradiction for the report to dwell on his over the board rating, because the evidence they present is exclusively from online chess. Yeah, well, I think they were in a tough spot because uh, people there was so much evidence, air quotes evidence, whatever um, data presented online about his OTB that I think. Uh, people were just desperate for someone with some authority um, to to present uh, the data. And they, as as we've discussed, and as you discussed with James Altucher a bit, I mean, their toggling data and stuff like that, their time data is not going to be um, applicable necessarily to OTB chess, but they do uh, have what's generally believed to be the best cheat detection method. So you would think it would be of some value. Um, so 
Uh, I didn't. Well, think you're 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 uh, you know crediting the insinuation that if he cheated online, he must have cheated over the board too. Well, it's a very I. It's not one that I necessarily share, but I, but as you know, it's a very common um, interpretation. And it does matter, actually. It, Neiman is a marked person, right? Uh, so so the look elsewhere effect does not apply to him as it does for other players. Well, what's the look elsewhere effect? So the look elsewhere effect. Um, there's a if you Google the wiki page, it has a great um, uh, uh, XKCD illustration. And this is basically the fact that if I get a, a so let's put it this way, if I test 5,000 players, just by random chance, I'm going to get a 3.6 sigma deviation, okay? And um, 3.5, 3.6. And that's just by normal chance. So now I suppose I get a 3.6 deviation from my testing of one player. Well, that one player may have had just a randomly really good tournament, but got noticed was the shiny marble. And so I can't say that the odds that he was uh, cheating were 5,000 to one, because there were 5,000 other players playing in tournaments that weekend or month that I could have tested. And th the reason why he got chosen was because you know, he had a great day and his games got noticed. Um, so in the XKCD comic, it, it talks about, you know, you're looking for systematic effects, a study of do jelly beans cause cancer? And you get a negative result for jelly beans on the whole. But if you go by colors of jelly beans and you have 44 colors of jelly beans, by random chance, one of those colors of jelly beans is going to give you a p-value less than 0 0.5 or 0 0.25. Um, and then you can't say, aha, this color of jelly bean causes cancer because I happened on this test to get the lucky academically significant p-value result. No, it's because there were implicitly or explicitly 44 other tests that you did. And this is a major issue. This is the largest single factor in what's called the reproducibility crisis in academics. If there is a natural study to do, of course, a couple of hundred universities and institutes in this country and around the world will want to do but the study. The ones that don't get a significant result don't publish and you never hear about them. By random chance, a handful will and they publish, and if two happen by random chance, it may even appear that the second one is confirming the first. But then after publication, it's a fresh slate, and when NIH tries to reproduce the study, they get a null, because it was a look elsewhere uh, artifact, not a... Uh, so, so this leads to the topic also of selection bias, which is also operating uh, in the Neiman case. Um, so that's that's the thing. The, the point of what I'm saying is that I posted data that was done on the fly. I deliberately not conditioned it at any well. I fixed a couple of, uh, of entries to make it more exact. So there's a note, a readme note about that on the site I showed. Because uh, I, you know, I had renamed, uh, I had two different names for the same tournament. So it was a duplicate. Uh, and, and I'd actually had a third because I thought Bar I miscopied games from Barcelona City Open to, to that tournament too. Um, but those data were random errors and they didn't change the conclusion one bit. Uh, but on the other hand, if you're cherry picking tournaments or missing data, then you are putting your thumb on the scale. That's, that's selection bias. Okay. And how would it work if like Hans Niemann, obviously, as uh, Fabiano Caruana, who we'll get to more in a minute, alluded to, he's, I think it's rightful to be more suspicious of him than other players, because we do know of his. Um, um, yes, all, he's marked. His, he's not um, a random one of 5,000 players. Right. The, he probably is best identified as belonging to a set of 50 players or so uh, who have confessed or generally no, publicly known to have cheated online. 
Okay, and and significant, not, not more than once. It's safe to say, being the the and more account. than once, yeah. yeah. So it's and more than once that that yeah. that yeah. Okay, so, but yeah. nonetheless, oh. it would only apply if you say, as you said, it was a random screening of five thousand people, and Hans Niemann were the one flagged. Obviously, if there, you're, it's a case of sort of updating your priors, and the chances that he's guilty are greater than if someone else were flagged. But in this case, there's no yeah. OTB data flagging him. Is that a correct interpretation? That's right. There is. There is. Despite no OTB what people data. are presenting, despite the many videos online. Right. There, okay. So, so the thing I the thing I need to say, you know, is is we need more scientists. There's not enough of me to go around. I have, in fact, been involved with the principal data of the case uh, from the beginning. So I don't have time to devote to, you know, it's easy for someone who doesn't take 15 minutes, you know, to, to generate pseudoscience and it takes 10 hours to combat rigorously. And mm -hmm. that's a uh, unfortunate, uh, uh, you know, uh, time imbalance. Okay. I very much appreciated what Nate Solon did. And I began with thanks, thanks for him, for, for him for checking some of this out. Okay. All right, so let's get to uh, Fabiano Caruana. So this one is a listener question. Moritz Vandermeer uh, had sent it in, and I also had already had this on my outline. So you may have seen the clip or may have seen the entire podcast, but uh, Fabiano went on uh, his, his new podcast, C Squared, uh, with Grandmaster Kristen Carilla, and he, he was just generally discussing the issue of cheating at the Grandmaster level. And this is a quote from Fabiano. He says, I would take Regan's analysis with a large grain of salt, and the reason why is not because I have any insight into his algorithm or methods, but because I know of a case, a very high-profile case, where with absolute certainty I can say that someone was cheating in an important event, and the person was investigated and was also exonerated based on Regan's analysis, and I am certain there was cheating. There is no doubt in my mind that this person was cheating and they got away with it. Um, so, and I'm sure there are other stories like this. How do you respond to this general uh, suggestion that may maybe your algorithm isn't sensitive enough or of specific cases? Okay. Where it Several things about that. First, I guessed which case right away, and this has since been confirmed, but in the interest of, of not naming names, I'm not going to say it. Okay. I will, however, they'll say some general things, a large subset of which apply in this case. Um, so first of all, there is a buffer zone. So, you know, FIDE, so first of all, the Court of Arbitration for Sport has several uh, standards. So balance of probability, comfortable satisfaction, and beyond reasonable doubt. They, you know, allow applying any standard, but generally they want to focus on the comfortable satisfaction standard. So therefore, FIDE uh, recognizes that as the objective and therefore is not going to make a sanction on something that only qualifies as balance of probability, even though by definition, when you say balance of probability, it's more you're saying it's you do think it's more likely that the person was was cheating than not, but it's not far enough into the interval. To, to warrant a, uh, to, to constitute acceptable proof of disqualification. So, there, so that buffer zone always operates. And in fact, the FIDE stand, the weakest FIDE standard for uh, a statistical result to corroborate other evidence is 2.5, not the conventional 2.0. And there's some very good reasons for that. I actually wanted 2.75, but it's 2.5. Um, and FIDE has never ex accepted statistical proof in the absence of other evidence. Maybe that is changing now, but the standard for that, when the look elsewhere effect is, is completely operating, is a z-score of five, the same standard used by science for de declaring a discovery. Okay. okay. And, I, and I won't shade it lower than 4.75. Okay. So that's that's number one. Number two, there are certain rules I follow. And one rule is that if a moves in a game or book, if they show up in the chess base or other tools, um, then I discard them. 
because I have to presume that the player knew those moves. It sometimes happens that an entire game gets discarded for that reason. So minor example from yesterday, um, you know, Alshon Moradidibadi lost in 10 moves to, uh, to um, with Lanier. Uh, now that game actually was played between Grishik and Duda before. Now, obviously Moradidibadi uh, didn't know about the Grishik Duda game, which was from a title Tuesday, otherwise wouldn't have put, fell on, fallen into the trap. But nonetheless, that game exists. So, you know, if I were doing a full test, I'd have to discard the game. Well, I've had cases where even with very brilliant games, there was a predecessor, and that goes, um, you know, even as far as move 25. There was a case in Europe nine years ago where a game was in my database through move 28, even though book by most players stopped at move 17. And that did make a, a, a you know, a, a not definitive, but significant difference in the Z score I obtained, but I had to presume the player knew it. And sure enough, I found a web log in a foreign language uh, where the player did say that, uh, that he had known about this earlier game. So I do have to follow rules like that. So you might say, okay, uh, you know, the player did really didn't know, but you know, then it's lucky. It's like bank error in your favor in Monopoly. Mm -hmm. the, the fact of the prior book means that I, following rules, have to throw it out from the test. Um, then, of course, you know, there, there are questions of rating uh, estimation. So I, I have been using my rating. When, when I'm doing a full test, then the committee uh, in, in, uh, in communication with people tries to arrive at a fair, up-to-date rating estimate of the player not the published rating, especially during the pandemic, the published rating being out of date. So that's another factor involved. So um, so in general, what I uh, uh, analogize the situation to is you're watching a football game and the call on the field is that the, the player was down before the goal line. And you look at the evidence of people and you can say, no, it really does look like the guy got over the goal line, but you know, there's no visual evidence to confirm that the person did. So you have to say the call on the field stands rather so, than is confirmed. So I don't believe that Fabiano uh, clarified, do you happen, are you at liberty to say if this was a, a online or OTB tournament? Oh, I think he said it was an OTB. Oh, okay. No, online, no, uh, no, I guess I'm not. I'm okay. Not you say which. Okay, but, but in, you're in, saying yeah. in the case of OTB, it's a, it's held to a higher standard because, as you say, there there need uh, visual yeah. evidence obviously increases the probability. Yeah. The the the, the one thing I, I, the one thing I'll say is that in all of these cases, if you're saying the call on the field stands. That's not the same thing as saying the call on the field is confirmed. So to say exonerated as if it were confirmed is wrong. Right. Which was probably just a poor word choice. But generally, it sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're you're saying you're saying it's it's not strictly your model that's making the decision. There's also uh, feed, you send the data to FIDE and then FIDE makes a decision. Right. And, and if it's an online tournament, there's the question of interfacing with other evidence. Mm -hmm. So I've had online cases where if I use the entirety of the data set, then I get a statistical negative, like a 1.5 Z-score. But then if I have knowledge that there was toggling or something that distinct or video movements that distinguishes some of the games or phases of the games, then I have gotten Z scores approaching the four mark in such cases. And that's a very strong corroboration of this other evidence. When there's other evidence, I only have to get past 2.5. Right. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, let's get to the next uh, listener question. Um, this one is from Han Chu, longtime friend of the pod. And for uh, listeners slash viewers who are not familiar, uh, Patreon supporters of Perpetual Chess um, can uh, send in questions. And it's related to what we're discussing. So I'll read it. It's a long question. Han asks, 
quote, my question is whether there's an inherent difficulty with a statistical approach to cheating. The price, quote, of a false positive seems much higher than the price of a false negative as the consequences of the accused are extremely high. So we have to be 99% certain that someone cheated and not 80%. How is the trade-off between false positives and false negatives made in your method? Um, and he says this trade-off can be reduced by looking at more information but when you're asked, quote, did Hans cheat in the game against Magnus, there is no way to increase the sample size. And if his method would accept the hypothesis of cheating at an 80% confidence level, but not at a 99% confidence level, you would reject the cheating hypothesis because of the high price of false positives. Is that correct? And then at the well, same time, sorry, go ahead. That's right. Can I cut off this long question? Yeah, there's only most of it I already answered in what I just said. Right. <laughs> with reference to this case mentioned by Caruana and in with FIDE policy in general. Now, the problem of sample size, yeah, that's a that's a real point. Uh that and that's a, another major difference with online chess. I in 2019, I put a lot of work into making my model sharper expressly on small sample sizes, with I think success. I should mention that the uh, that if I go by Cyril Marslow's confession in the Sebastian Feller case, that's a sample of under 100 moves where my model was effective with a 2650 rated player. So that also long ago already answered the question of can it work at this rating level. Um, Okay, so that's so that's the rest of the answer. You can finish the question, but I wanted to kind of yeah. Yeah, it's. You, it's pretty much covered. Um, um, thank you. And yeah, that that makes me wonder. Fabiano in the same podcast talked about whether you had done back testing of cases that were already known to be cheating. Yeah, that there aren't enough of them for me to positively profile cheating, but yeah, they're important checks. Yeah. Okay. And how? And generally, are they like? Are they flagging the people that say someone admitted yes. to? Okay. Um, well, and, and generally during the pandemic, what, what changed a lot of minds at FIDE was just the day-to-day -day effectiveness of my model for cheating online during the pandemic, a domain that I don't claim to be supreme in, mm -hmm. uh, because in online chess, you can get all this other information besides. But nevertheless, it was effective enough that my results are usually used as given as explanations to the players because I can give an explanation without compromising my model in the same way that giving toggling evidence would. Okay. Okay. Next uh, Patreon supporter question is from Stephen Par Sparks. Stephen asks, he says, does it bother you that quite a few observers, including prominent GMs, have either not noticed you're an IM or doubt whether you have the chess ability to evaluate whether cheating is happening? Isn't that the point of the model? As you explained to James Altucher, uh, your model explicitly excludes chess knowledge in favor of statistical analysis. Uh, and can you explain for viewers and listeners why your model excludes chess knowledge? Okay, yeah. So part of the reason is A, to avoid bias, and B, to incorporate chess knowledge, I would have to pay every grandmaster in the world a lot of money to input about a hundred to a thousand positions each. Uh, so in order to get a corpus. So no, it's actually one point is that my model uses minimal information, only the computer's own values of the moves to feed to a standard utility function of the kind that economists use all the time. Um, and that way there's no dependence on perception. So occasionally I get, you know, clunky things. Like most commonly, my model will often say that capturing, uh, so Black's got a knight on c6 and captures on d4, and you've got your bishop on e3 and your knight on f3. So capturing with the bishop on e3 is a chess-wise dumb move. Nevertheless, it may not have a much lower engine evaluation than the capturing with the knight or the pawn. And uh, so my model will give the capture with the bishop move a higher probability than is probably humanly warranted. But even with the 100 data points, the distortion from that averages out. I have internal evidence 
that the projections of my model are accurate on average within four percentage points relatively, and almost and you know most of the time within eight percentage points relatively. So if my model says a move is fifty percent likely to be played by a player of given rating, most of the time I'm within eight percent of fifty is four percentage points, and that's the kind of information that a person doing implement booking a book for real-time betting on chess moves wants to know mm -hmm. with setting the initial betting line. Um, and because it's a relative error, my model is especially good at gauging the frequency of blunders or of unlikely moves. Okay, yeah, what you and James Altucher described as um, shiny objects, right? Like Well, that's that, yeah, that's a separate thing. That is how I achieved sharper results on small sample sizes because my model now about one seventh, one eighth of the time, depending on the rating of the player, predicts an inferior move to be more likely than the best move. If there's indication that the in inferior move looked better at lower depths. Okay. Yeah. And as you mentioned with James, that it, it was better than the null model. It performed better when you added that element. Right. Okay. And and we have a similar question. And sorry if there's some overlap with these questions, but I think part of the reason why is that these are the questions that all chess fans and players are grappling with. Right. Um, so this one is from Randall Temple. And again, we talked about it vis-a-vis -vis Hans, but maybe you could talk about it more generally, which is, is your fair play analysis vulnerable to a high-rated grandmaster cheating sparingly? Um, if so, can anomaly detection be improved to combat that style of cheating? Yeah, so I'll repeat the answer I gave you three years ago. I'm not going to catch cheating on one move per game. I uh, you know, did a rough estimate that cheating on three moves per game in a six to nine round tournament, I had a fair chance to hit 2.50 on that. Uh, and two move per game, well, no, but don't push it. Uh, so I'll just repeat that. The other thing that I repeat is the common metaphor for what that person just said is flying under the radar. Mm -hmm. But flying under the radar means staying at a constant low altitude. If you cheat at a constant rate, then you will eventually get caught. In order to stay under the Z-score threshold, you have to tail off your cheating according to the square root of the number of games you've played. So you can't maintain a constant cheating rate. Eventually you get caught. Eventually things look red enough. And that's exactly what happened with Igor Srausis and with other people. Okay, yeah. And I'll, I'll quote something from our, our interview of three years ago too, which is you said that we need a magician at every tournament. To uh, observe players, yeah, yes. Yeah, you quoting Frederick right. Friedel, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's right. That's 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 also important because it's probably the most difficult kind of cheating is the imperceptible little signals. Right. But if and I was someone watching the room the way a magician does, then yeah. That, yeah. That, that and works. I was thinking about it. The other thing is, unfortunately, I don't know if a magician without a chess background would cut it. You need you need a magician with working knowledge of chess, I think, in order to really. Well, I cite Percy Diaconis and Mark Leffler himself as that kind of magician. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll have the, uh, similar to as you said, and as I agree with about yourself, there there may not be enough to go around, unfortunately. Well, arbiters are being trained in this kind of watchfulness. So, uh, and and, it, and there have been there, there was a case last month of a player with a mobile phone being caught before anything could register, uh, uh, before enough to register on my screen. So. Okay. And and the last question is is related to this, and this is from uh, Tyron Ross Price, who asks, which steps do you think chess federations should take to reduce the possibility of OTB uh, cheating? Well, I mean, yeah, so you need technology. You need watchfulness uh, for what I just said. Broadcast delay, uh, I mean, if it's, if it's you know, I, I've still not known a case where that was a definitive element, um, but uh, broadcasting was someone following the games in real time. 
Well, the Feller but, yeah. case, I, I believe there were three parties involved, right? Right. And the point is, because there was the second party on site, mm -hmm. you had this channel of communication that could go the other way. Oh, that's true. Right. So it also may have been the a person broadcast, with the but... hidden camera had a channel of communication going the other way. The accomplice, or the accomplice was viewing the game that way rather than relying on the person getting onto a broadcast board. Mm -hmm. There are there was a, a Twitter post about claiming Neiman did much better in games that were broadcast, but Todd Bryant, who uh, was cited by the Strong Chess or the Strong Chess uh, Twitter account, uh, shot that one down. Yeah, yeah. So. And generally, do you do you find? I mean, people have been arguing so much online, and I understand it's a it's a high profile story and. Um, it's kind of easy to get invested in it when when you when your model comes under criticism or people uh, post things that you don't consider um, to be uh, mathematically backed up. Do you find it personally frustrating? Does it does it bother you? I can't afford to to let it be personal frustrating. And and getting back to Carolina, the first thing I said is that because of the need for the buffer zone, his comment is actually fair enough. Right. You know, okay. If, for, for fairness, according to the next listener's question, we do have to operate with this gap between likelihood and, uh, and, and assurance. Um, so I, 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 that's why I you know, told people, you know, in, in, in that sense, Caruana's criticism is fair enough, even though in, in others it's not. Um, so no, I, 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 I did not read Twitter. And, and, you know, and there's sometimes I even like quoting, like, you know, uh, Grisha quoting that I only catch idiots. You know? <laughs> so, um, so the one thing that Carlson said that puts me in opposition is his assertion, you know, that Neiman cheated more than he admitted. That's clear because there's this tournament in 2017, April 4, 2017, which when he was 14, is not covered by his admission. And of course, the other tournaments uh, and is in the matches against the five grandmasters, which I'm you know listed on record as agreeing with. Those were certainly not random games, and they were for rating. And Neiman changed from saying unrated to saying, "Well, I did it to gain some rating points." Um, but uh, incidentally, another thing is the. The uh, April 4, 2017 is the same date involved in the Dlugi emails. It's about the same tournament. Mm -hmm. And that's something that Chess Twitter seems not to have noticed, something <laughs> I spotted instantly. So, so again, uh, 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 anyway. Um, but the um, uh, Carlson's words, you know, if you say more recently, it could mean that August 2020, is more recent than Neiman's 17th birthday, which was June 20, 2020. But most people are taking it to mean uh, the years 2021 and 2022. Yeah. And, and that's where I have my you know negative picture. Okay. Yeah. And he so seemed... I'd like to get that clarified. Yeah. And even though he didn't, he was very careful not to explicitly accuse Neiman of uh, cheating in their game, he still seemed to to hint at it. I mean when he mentioned his uh, his not being fully concentrated um and not looking nervous um like why did he put yeah. that there if he didn't think he was uh cheating in that game right it's funny that have you seen anyone claim high engine correlations by a more reliable method than let's check for that game for that game no for that game i think even let i don't even think let's check flagged it did it yeah okay um so that that so so no in it, so in some of my regular tests it does give a higher baseline so i'll share my screen once more uh okay. and go to so this by the way this is my one in five thousand selection bias but also marking with a black spot uh explanation this dates to 2012. i have something even older to show here so this dates to 2007. And the, the shiny object is the later principle, the second principle I model, the first principle of this in bold face. And so if a move is given a clear standout evaluation by a program, then it's more likely to be found by a strong human play, 
human player. So if a, if a game is clear cut, so even those grandmasters who have pointed out that I'm not a grandmaster when I'm trying to uh, ad, ad, analyze the Carlson Neiman game have given their opinion that Black's play actually is quite clear cut. Okay, from chess knowledge. I mean, you know the strategy, gang up on the C pawn, then gang up on White's bishop. And even the E3 move, this brilliant pawn sacrifice, you know, some grandmasters say, oh, come on, we see that sort of thing all the time. So, so I do have grandmaster opinion concurring that Black's play is fairly clear cut. Well, according to my model, especially if I use Komodo 13 and not Stockfish as the test to, for building the model and testing concordance, then I get an evocation of this principle. So Neiman matches 71% on the relevant moves, but the baseline projection is 69%. That's 10 percentage points above the average position. But again, my model is saying that this end game play by Black was fairly clear cut. Okay. So this is a case where even without explicit chess knowledge, my model is according with Grandmaster opinion. Okay. Um... And by the way, I remembered what I was going to ask you uh, briefly. So bringing it back to what you had said about uh, the case that Caruana raised and the the buffer zone um, where you said maybe there was an elevated probability in this case that someone was cheating, but not enough to, air quotes, indict them. Um, now, in the case of Neiman, um, when you run your analysis, is it within that same buffer zone? Is it strong evidence, but not conclusive? Or yeah, is it just I'll, I'll, doesn't stand out at all? I'll let on about this. So in actual fact, there has been a gap in, in so, so, so the results that I don't agree with in the chess.com report, let's not say I don't agree with, because if presented the toggling evidence, then he might say, yeah, right. Okay. But so let's put it as, can I reproduce the results in my system? So the results they reproduce, especially, you know, uh, the, the, the title Tuesdays in 2015 and 2017, and the games against Nepo, for instance, those are absolutely clear. Um, and then, however, the results I don't agree with, they're not in that buffer zone. There, I, I've even used the word bupkis in, in a private email. <laughs> okay. So, you know, so that's the other thing. I mean, you've got to turn a lot. You've got to have a really powerful selection criterion in order for the bump to show in my model. Now, chess.com trumpets their selectivity criterion, although the report gives no, no details. And I should reiterate, I'm under an NDA with chess.com. But I can I can even just more simply disclaim any knowledge. The report gives me no idea, and I have no idea of how their selectivity criterion works. I could explain mine, but uh, but not um, uh, but not theirs. Okay. So so I'm at a bit of a loss here. And on um, the o on on the OTB front, the six tournaments that Chess.com mentions, would those be? I know we right. already went through them. So but would Havana those be in the buffer Memorial, zone? Bupkis, total, okay. nothing, nothing close at the all. You zone, be not the buffer zone. <laughs> Negative Z score. Okay. okay, it's not you know two or three. It's minus point zero six. I think is what I got or something. Uh, I have to look at my results. Okay. So and and what would make you? rethink your model what would have to happen where you just said okay i you know i this is all wrong well so what i what i said is if you have someone who's smart enough to cheat enough in havana to gain enough advantage to score 7.5 out of nine and yet also uncheat enough without disturbing the games to make my screening score which heavily downweights cases where you're ahead, um, go under 50%, then all I'd have to do is tip my hat to you. Right. Okay. So, um, but I, I, I have not had, no, no, no online platform, nothing has, has come forward to me with the case where they can demonstrate that my model is wrong. Maybe this will be 
the uh, the situation. But one thing is, I do have a bedrock quantification of gain. So I can tell you how many effective rating points Neiman gained from a set of moves. And you cannot create gain out of nothing in my measure. Only if you tell me that you have cheating data on the good moves and they weren't the bad moves and that Neiman played horribly on every move that was bad, that could move it. And I will say this about the Sebastian Feller case. Okay, um, on the just under 40% of the sample, where you could either take Marzalo's confession of four games or the privileged knowledge I had. It's a very similar answer. He played at a rating level above 3,000. On the remaining 60 plus percent of the sample, Feller played at 2550 level, so 100 points below his rating. So you can get that kind of Red Sea effect. But, uh, and that's why the overall result was only 1.5 something. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for, all, for all of his games together. Um, That's the bimodal so, distribution they also discuss in, uh, in the chess.com report, right? Well, that's right. That's, that's a slightly different technical matter. That's actually the reason why I cleaned up my data uh, to remove duplicates and also to, to uh, use my curve. The, res with the results from Coinbase tournaments that I had posted, I forgot with the four cap, I hadn't updated them to use the more precise time measurement. I was using the generic rapid settings for game 25. And I just forgot that when I posted it originally. So, so, so that created a low signal that looked bimodal to, to someone knowledgeable. Okay. So then I eradicated that. The person still came claims a low signal in my OTB uh, but hasn't written back, and I don't think there's enough data to get a significant result for that. So. Okay. Um, okay, well, this has been quite insightful. Uh, one one question before, <laughs> at least for me, before we let you go, I know that James Altucher uh, was was trying to get some some chess wisdom from you. Um, and I know you're not you're not super active playing. Obviously, you're extremely busy. But I'm curious, with your background, uh, Dr. Regan, if you were to try to use data to improve your chess game, um, is there is there anything that stands out as an approach you would use? Uh, I would probably read chess books by strong players <laughs> and just just and study openings. What my data can be used for is opening prep to judge the likelihood of gambles succeeding. Right. And I think this happens more often in blitz, although uh, a, a, a confirmation of the hypothesis that I expected did not pan out. And um, so, so that's, so I could, you could use my model for training. I also, I think, but I've not had time even to do the egotistical thing of typing my own score sheets in. I think I'm actually was 2,600 strength at end games and that my 2,450 rating is an average of my good end game play versus my horrible openings. <laughs> uh, so, um, or that was my highest rating. It's 2,372 now. It's, well, it's long out of, long on inactive. But um, so, so if I studied more, I, I could probably still become a grandmaster, I guess. But, wow, that'd know, be fun to see. That, that would be a, a fun pursuit to see. But yeah, that might might take I was a on that curve. Yeah, yeah, no, I was on yeah. That curve in the seventies. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, you were you were amongst the very best in your age group consistently. So certainly, you were on that trajectory. But um, mm -hmm. but now it's uh yeah, Father Time makes things more challenging for sure. Um, well, well, father, other work, Father. Writing a textbook on quantum computation, where I also want to write an instructor's manual and do research on why I think there are impediments to universal quantum computation. Okay. Uh, that's the Neiman case has put that off by a month. So. <laughs> okay, well, hopefully you can you can get back to work on uh, on your day job. Well, Ken, I really appreciate your taking the time. Um, do you have anything to add before we say our goodbyes? No, I think I, we did, especially at the end, cover the uh, the points that I think most need needed clarification and and you know vis-a-vis -vis the internet. So yeah, 
Um, okay. Great. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, and and thanks for all all of your work you're doing to try to try to keep our game clean and some um, constant uh, and possibly increasing challenge. Okay. Okay. Right. Take Thank care. You. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Bye.